Dragon's Dogma 2 is a fantasy RPG with magic, mythical creatures and a lot more. It still aims to keep the player grounded because of its mechanics and systems. This can make the game really challenging for newcomers to the series as things you expect to see in your average RPG won't be available till later in the game or it isn't in the game at all. In this video I will give you several tips to help you on your way to becoming the mightiest of all arisen. The first thing you need to know is when you're going through your character creation is that weight and height can affect how your character moves and how much they can carry. You want to think about what type of vocation will suit your character's stature. For example, a small height for your character will lead to faster stamina regeneration which is great for a thief or an archer. This is because they need to be quick and agile, whereas a heavy weight will be better for characters that need a larger carrying capacity, like a warrior or a fighter. The taller your character is, is the slower your stamina regeneration is, but they will be able to run faster. And the lighter your character is, the less they can carry. I will leave a link in the description for more information on your character's weight and how it works. So it's best to understand what vocation you want to select from early on, but you're not locked into any particular vocation. You can change your vocation at any of the vocation guilds, but do try to limit this in the early game because it can become costly. Select a vocation that suits your play style. If you select the fighter, you'll be equipped with a shield. The fighter usually draws more attention as its focus is around close range combat. The fighter is basically a tank. Using the shield you're able to block and parry attacks. You're not able to block or parry in any of the other starting vocations. If you select a mage or an archer, you don't want to be too close to enemies as these vocations are better suited to long range combat. The Thief is another close range combat vocation, but it doesn't have the defensive capabilities as the fighter. It's about dodging, avoiding and getting in behind. You get a dash button to quickly evade. You do not want to take too many hits as a Thief as you will go down quickly. Now for all vocations, no matter which one you choose, positioning on the battleground is vitally important. Try to make sure that you can see all the enemies on the field. Even if you're a fighter and you have a shield, you can still get attacked from behind. And this is when you need to think about your pawn's vocation, as this is vitally important to make sure you can cover your weaknesses. Between myself and my pawn, I usually have one of us dealing in physical damage and one of us being a mage. This is so I can have better control over the mage's movesets. As I'm a thief in this playthrough, my pawn is a mage to make sure that they're able to heal me, grant me elemental boons like fire and ice, and they're able to cure any debilitations that I might get in combat. Now as you can see, I gave my pawn red eyes, that's just me being a troll. If you enlist a pawn and they have red eyes, and they're not following orders, and they're being very rude, kill them. This is because they have Dragon's Plague. Dragon's Plague is a disease that can only be acquired by pawns. It's contagious and can jump from one pawn to another in your party. Essentially what will happen, your pawn will become stronger and more effective in combat. Eventually it will turn into a massive dragon and wipe out whatever town you are currently resting in, killing every villager and the game will save and there's no going back from that. It can ruin your entire playthrough. Luckily there is symptoms of Dragon's Plague. You just need to spot the following. Glowing red eyes. If you see them acting lethargic where your pawn's sitting down on the ground, your pawn is getting headaches and they're holding their head or physically acting like they're in pain. If they stop listening to your commands and if they start giving you attitude and they become extremely effective in combat. The quickest and easiest way to get rid of Dragon's Plague is to throw all three pawns off a cliff or into this sea or lake for the brine to get them. Once you've done this, return to a rift stone to summon your own pawn and hire two completely different pawns. And there should be no sign of Dragon's Plague. I know this seems obvious, but during combat, you wanna keep an eye on your health and stamina gauge. When you take damage to your health, your overall health will reduce and will only be able to recover through resting at camps and inns. So the longer you're out battling and taking damage, the lower your overall health pool will be. You also want to be careful when using all your stamina, because if you run out of stamina, 
your character will stop to rest and will be vulnerable for several seconds. Now there is the all heal elixir which will heal everything including your lost health pool. But I never managed to get this in the early game. Make sure to keep an eye out for the quest you pick up. Listen to what the NPCs are actually saying because there's a chance that it might be a timed quest. To find out if it's a timed quest, go into your quest log and you will see an hourglass next to the quest. Make sure to do them right away as there's consequences for not completing them within a certain time. If you do get stuck on any quests, you can see the oracle in Vermund. It will help guide you for 50 gold. You can also go to the Riftstone and get a pawn that has quest knowledge. Just make sure that the quest you're having trouble with is set. When you're in towns and villages, make sure to talk to as many NPCs as possible because there's no quest markers in this game and you might miss important quests. Just a quick tip, when talking to NPCs, you usually have to hold in the circle button or the equivalent to whatever controller you're using. If you go into the settings, you can change it so that when you press circle, you can talk and you can hold in the circle button to hail so you can switch it around. It might make things easier for you when walking around and talking to NPCs. Don't forget pawn commands. Pawn commands are essential. You can tell your pawns to stop, go, follow and help. Go is great for several things. It can help you get to your next destination. You will see a little hand icon by your pawn's name. You just need to follow them and they'll run ahead. Bear in mind, the pawn will need quest knowledge to be able to lead you. From time to time on your journey, a pawn might mention that there's a chest or a rift stone nearby that they found in another world. If you press the goal button, an exclamation mark will appear next to their name and you just need to follow them and they will take you to the chest or rift stone. You will come across chests in the world that are too high and you won't be able to reach. Now if you've got a warrior or a fighter in your team with a certain skill, they'll be able to launch you in the air to reach the chest. For the warrior, they'll need a skill called ladder launch and for the fighter, it's a skill called springboard. All you have to do is go to an area near the chest and press the goal button and your pawn will launch you in the air. The wait button is self-explanatory. It tells the pawn to wait in a certain location. To me, we'll issue a command to your pawns to follow you, which is good for fleeing or getting them closer to regroup during fights or even when you're trying to out run trash mobs and the final command is help which is great for when you're low on health or you've got a debilitation one of your pawns will come over to help you with either curative magic or curative items now debilitations are negative status conditions which can lead to you taking extra damage or even leaving you vulnerable there's debilitations such as sleep which will render you unconscious which will leave you vulnerable to being attacked and there's ones like drenched which happens when you are salt and this will lead you vulnerable to lightning attacks which will make you numb and ice attacks which will freeze you. Debilitations can also afflict enemies too. This can be done with skills and items such as the archer being able to use drenching shot which can soak enemies leaving them vulnerable to ice and lightning attacks. Now from time to time you are going to die because this game is punishing and there is ways to avoid death. If you come close to dying, there are quick buttons to go into your inventory and use a curative item. As I'm playing on the PS5, you can press L1 and left on the D-pad which will take you straight into your inventory, allowing you to select whatever curative you want to use. Or if you press L1 and up, you will use any curative you have. If you lose all of your health and you're about to die, there is a small window for you to be able to heal before you hit the ground. Obviously, if you fall from a height and die, there's no chance of you being able to do that. But if you use one of the quick methods in time in that small window, you won't die. If you do die, you can instantly revive at full health if you have a wake stone. A wake stone is a revival item that you can use on yourself or any NPCs. You can find a whole wake stone, but it's more common to find wake stone shards. They can be found all around the world and you get given them for completing quests. Three shards will make a stone. I will say use them wisely. Save them for more important situations. There's nothing wrong with dying and respawning at a checkpoint. You will lose a portion of your max health if you do this well. And this is why camping is important. There's more dangerous enemies patrolling the roads and in the forests at night, so it's important for you to camp. 
you will need a camping kit. In the early game you will not need to buy one as you can get one for free in one of the early quests that you can collect in Melv. They are quite heavy so make your pawn carry it. At a camp you can change your skills which is great to pick skills to suit whatever situation you're in. If you're camping outside a cave and you know that once you reach that cave you're going to be fighting a lot of goblins, it gives you a chance to assign skills that are going to be strong against that enemy. You can also cook food at camps which will give you different buffs. Once you've had something to eat, make sure to rest till the morning. This will replenish all of your lost health for you and your pawns, but be prepared because there is a chance for you to be attacked during your night. If this does happen, your camping kit will be destroyed and you will need to acquire a new one. Once you reach Vermund, find Mildred, as she will let you stay at her house for 7 days, allowing you to save money instead of paying to rest at an inn. After 7 days, you can buy the house from her for 20,000 gold, which is worth it considering how expensive inns can be. You'll want to save as much gold as possible in the early game so you can buy the house. You also might need to buy better gear, so this is one of the reasons why you shouldn't switch vocation too soon. You do get gear when you switch vocations but they're basic and it might cause a difficulty spike when you're back on the road. What I did when I reached Vermund is I sold all my materials so I was able to buy better gear. Once I got better gear, then I started to save the materials instead of selling them so I'm able to upgrade my gear. After a quest or a long time away from the village or city, go to the vocation guild to check to see what new skills and augments you've unlocked. It's good to see how these new skills may aid you in battle or give you another playstyle. You also want to change the two pawns in your party to a higher level pawn. If you're level 10, do not keep level 2 pawns, as these pawns are likely to go down as the game gets harder. Now, there's no conventional fast travel in Dragon's Dogma 2. What you need is fairy stones and a port crystal. Fairy stones are used to instantly travel back to a set port crystal. You'll want to save as many as you can in the early game, but I do understand if travelling gets a little bit annoying and tiring. Make sure to touch the port crystal in Vermund because if you don't, you won't be able to use a fairy stone to travel there. What I would suggest is to use ox carts as much as possible. You can use ox carts to travel to and from different locations for a set fee, but be aware an ox cart can be attacked halfway through its journey and if the ox cart does get destroyed you will need to continue the rest of your journey on foot. You can also find a port crystal. Now a port crystal is something that you can place on the ground in most locations and what this will do is it will allow you to travel back and forth to this location using a fairy stone. If you do put a port crystal down don't worry they can be recollected at any time and replaced in a different location. So that's all my beginner tips for the early game. Now if you've watched this video and you think there's a couple of things that I've missed or have not covered, let us know down in the comments below, especially for the newcomers as well so they can see them. And if you want to see my full review for Dragon's Dogma 2, I will leave an in video link and a link in the description below. My name is Jammer, thank you for watching, please like and subscribe and I will see you in the next one.